Romans chapter 11, turn there if you would tonight. Um, we're laying out some doctrines concerning uh, Israel. Um, we looked last Wednesday night at the promises God made. Um, Genesis 12, God made a promise to Abram before he was Abraham. Uh, we looked at some other passages as well that I didn't have in my notes. Hebrews 11 was one of them. Uh, but tonight, let's look at uh, Romans 11. Um, let's see here. Where was it? Yeah. We'll be in Romans 11. If you look just, just quickly at Romans 10, chapter 1. Paul starts it out like this, saying, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, I mean, obviously, he's talking about his own people. Paul was a Jew from what tribe? Anybody know? Benjamin. Just, isn't that interesting? Yet two Sauls in the Bible, both of them were from Benjamin. Benjamin, Saul must be a Benjamite name, I guess. Um, but Saul was from the a tribe of Benjamin, the 12th tribe. And um, so he is a Jew by nature. He was born one, circumcised on the eighth day. Paul always talked about that. And um, every time he gave a chance to tell his testimony, he always told him, I was a Jew, I was a religious Jew by nature. I was a zealot. And he said, you couldn't talk me out of it. And he said, as far as that Christ fella, I hated him. Hated all the people that followed him because he, in Paul's opinion, he broke the law. But he didn't. He came to fulfill it. When Paul was made re, uh, aware of that by Jesus himself, it changed his life. So he says that he, his prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Zeal alone doesn't get it. Being religious doesn't cut it. Lots of religious people. And I would say lots of good religious people in this world if you sort of judge on the outward appearance of the morality. They are good people. There is also very evil religious people, as we know. Uh, but, um, so Paul is obviously talking about the Jews, Israel, of the Old Testament. He wants to see them saved. He has a heart's desire for them and a prayer that I believe God is going to fulfill one of these days. So um, we're going to start in Romans chapter 11. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Appreciate all of you coming out. Appreciate you folks uh, with us online. You pray for me. I felt lousy the last couple days. And I mean bad. And today it was different kind of lousy than it was yesterday so we'll see how tomorrow goes father we ask your blessings on your word tonight i do thank you lord for gathering us together in your house tonight father we pray lord that you would visit with all of those who could not make it tonight we pray god that your word would shine forth into their hearts let us be a blessing to them though they live in this area or they live abroad we pray dear god that you would uh, touch them with your word and Father, give us uh, understanding that we have a role to fulfill in this age, in this world that brings us to the world to come. When Jesus is going to come back, he's going to rule over his people. He's going to fulfill the promises that he made to their forefathers. Those promises have not been fulfilled. They cannot be broken because they come from you. Help us, dear God, to understand that. Help us, Father, Lord, uh, to give us understanding concerning our role in the salvation of the Jews. Father, we pray that you'd bless them. And help us, dear God, to never, never go against the apple of the Lord's eye. So bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Romans 11, verse 1. Uh, several teachings in the Bible that attribute, sort of give us the idea that we're like trees or that 
Christ is a tree and we're branches on that tree. In John 15, he said, I'm the vine, ye are the branches. And he said, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Fruit bearing was always the mark of God's blessing. It was always the mark of salvation. So whenever Jesus, we have several instances of this in the gospels, when Jesus saw a tree, that was not bringing forth any fruit, he cursed it. And in some cases, that tree would wither and die. Although he told a parable one time about a tree that was bringing forth no fruit, and the, I guess the landowner was going to cut it down, and, and the servant said, My Lord, give me a chance. Let me dig around it. Let me dung it. Let me put some manure next to it. Let's give it a chance before we just give up on it. Maybe that was you. Maybe the first time God knocked on your door, you weren't ready for it, or it wasn't time, but somebody, somebody spent some time. Somebody cared. Somebody cared, okay? Uh, I wasn't necessarily married to this tree we had out here in the front, uh, but I hated to see that the, the wind knocked it down or whatever happened to it. And there used to be an old tree out here in the front, way up there by the road. I hated mowing around that thing because it was dropping branches all the time. But finally, it was, it was time to let it go, and that's what happens. But I kind of like that old tree. Uh, the tree that's behind Alicia and Michael's house over here, the first pastor that I was under in this church, his son had a tree house up in that tree that was awesome. And we used to get up in that tree. I would, would not want anything to happen in that tree. So every now and then you care about trees. Well, some people you just care about. And there's some people you just don't want to give up on. Amen. And so I think that tree represents Israel. So he says, Romans 11 verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. And understand something about Paul. By this time, by the time Paul's writing this epistle to the Romans, surely by this time, Paul has already, there's, if you read in the book of Acts, Paul got to a place in his ministry where he said, I will not ever again go to another synagogue and preach. Early on, that's what he always did. No matter what city he went to, he sought out the Jews' synagogue. He went there and, wanted, and met with the Jews, preached Jesus to the Jews. He did it according to the law. He went all the way from the law, all throughout the things of the Old Testament, and tried to preach to the Jews. Some he reached early on. After a while, it became apparent because they kept trying to have him killed. They kept throwing him out. They kept laying charges against him, and they would always argue with him. And at some point, Paul washed his hands and said, I'm never going to do this ever again. That's, I think, what Jesus refers to. Don't cast your pearls before the swine. And so Paul just said, I'm done. Now, did he quit loving his people? No. He prayed for them the rest of his life. And he says here, God, God has not cast away his people. Verse 2. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. That's the doctrine of salvation that is related to predestination. The idea that God knows already who is going to be saved and who isn't going to be saved. But I think in contradiction to Calvinism, Calvinism says, since God already knows, you got nothing to do with it. You don't have a choice in it. You don't have it. It's not a decision you make at all, which is not true. Okay. But in this case, that predestination is based upon God's foreknowledge. And that's what he's saying here. That God cast away his people, which he foreknew. No, he can't. Why would he? If he already knows that a future generation, and I know a guy, I've been friends with him for years. He is half Jew. His dad was full-blooded Jew, but he got saved. 
So if God's done dealing with Jews, that man's sure an anomaly. And did God know he was going to get saved? Sure he did. He foreknew it. So God is not going to cast him away simply because uh, he's Jewish or he's an Israelite or what, I don't know what tribe he would be from. Uh, you can't tell necessarily by his last name. But anyway, God, God does not cast away people that he knows at some point in the future, they are going to return to him. And in this case, Paul is telling us that God has seen the future and he knows that there are going to be Jews who are going to turn to Jesus. Not turn to the law, but turn to Christ. So he says, uh, God has not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias. He's referring to Elijah. How he maketh intercession to God against Israel saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars. And I am left alone and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Now that number 7,000, what do you think that means? Why, why did God, and, and of course I believe that it was true in Elijah's day that there were 7,000 Jews that had not gone the way of Ahab and Jezebel. That was in Elijah's day. That had not gone after them, had not gone after the prophets of Baal. And God had reserved 7,000 Jews to serve him. That I believe. But if we were to apply that to the future, what do you think that 7,000 references? Huh? Thousand year reign. What else? Huh? There's a thousand. There's another thousand. I'll take your thousand and I'll, I'll take your seven thousand and see you 144,000. What else? Seventh day. So it's time prophecy. Y'all are getting there. Daniel 9. 70 weeks. And the seven things that God said he was going to do for Israel during that time. And all seven of them, if you go read Daniel 9, all seven of them were referenced to for the forgiveness. Of the, in fact, let's do that. Daniel 9, first rabbit number one. I kept during Pastor Mike online yesterday, I kept having a sh Mike shut up, quit chasing those rabbits and you'll never get done with this. Because I'm getting to the point, once I get on a rabbit trail, I get lost and I can't remember where, how, how do I get back from here? In uh, Daniel chapter 9, he said 70 weeks in verse 24, determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to number one, finish the transgression. See, it's the number seven. It's always going to do with completion. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. And all seven of these deal with the forgiveness of sins, re requiring uh, no more guiltiness on Israel's part for their transgressions, seven for the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God. All of that applies in there. Every bit of it applies in there. So the 7,000 that uh, God reserved unto him are both historic and prophetic so there is a coming time there's a coming generation of jewish people that god is going to forgive their sins and what do they have to do in order to gain that not a zip nothing okay not a zip is a theological term it means nothing all right um so he said then verse five even so at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And he said at this time now, if you look at Acts chapter 2, you'll see the first 3,000 people to get saved were Jews. The 120 people in the upper room were Jews. 
And then after a while, you have Jews, and you got Jews in Judea. And then you have Jews in Samaria. But then you get into the uttermost part of the world, it's predominantly Gentiles. And even at this present time, there are, you could say, Jews for Jesus, all right? Um, can you imagine how many people take trips to the Holy Land? How many Christians go to the Holy Land, go to Israel for, for a tourist trip and try to witness to those because, I mean, the Jews know that these American Christians, these Gentile Goyim Christians are going to come over. They're going to come over with a big pocket full of money. So we're going to be their tour guides. And we're going to have to listen to their New Testament stuff about Jesus. But for the most part, it doesn't shake them. It's like the Bible's right. They, many of them are not religious Jews. They know just enough to, do, to lead the tours. They're not practicing Jews, but even at that, what they read in the Old Testament, they're blinded in part. The veil of Moses is over them, and they don't understand it, except God might lift the veil off of one every now and then. There was a rumor going around years ago that uh, people, Jew, Jewish rabbis, were having visions of the Messiah, and all of a sudden Jews were getting saved. I'm not, I, don't, I don't buy that. I'm, I may be wrong, but I just, I'm not convinced on that yet. But anyway, so he said he called it the election of grace. Now guys like John Hagee, I know, and probably others, they talk big about Israel, but Hagee says that in order for it, the Jews of the last days to be saved, God is going to restore unto them Sacrifice, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament and they will be saved by sacrificing little animals in the rebuilt temple. I do not believe that. I do not believe that because he said, and he's going to say it like this. He says it in verse 5. There is a remnant according to the election of grace. Verse 6, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. So if he saves them by, the, by restoring the sacrificial system of the Old Testament, them killing little goats and lambs and bullocks, then they can't be saved by grace. Can't be. And, but if it be of works, then it is no more of grace. Otherwise, I didn't, well, I missed part. If by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now, in the election, he's referring to either Jews who are saved or Gentiles who are saved. Did, does God elect and foreknow only the Gentiles? No. Does he elect and foreknow only the Jews and saves the Gentiles by chance? No. They're both elected, which is what we're going to do in November. We're going to select, unless, of course, the mail-in votes select a candidate for us. Don't get me started. But we're going to elect someone. God has elected us. God has chosen us. Just as God chose that 7,000 and God reserved them. And this, I think, cannot be taught enough. Because how many church members get arrogant about how they're saved as if they did the majority of the saving? I chose God. I followed Jesus. I stayed faithful. No, you didn't. God elected you, called you, chose you, sanctified you. And yes, it's what you wanted. But God is the one who did the work in you. Or else then it's right back with works again and it's boasting. So 
Uh, verse 7, what then? Israel has not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath attained it, and the rest were blinded. And that goes again to what Paul said earlier in Romans, blindness in part. Behold, I, I, lest you be ignorant of this mystery, that blindness in part is happening to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. He said, the rest are blinded. According as written, God hath given them spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap. Think of their table. The table, I think part of this applies to the table of showbread. The Jews, the Levites, every day had to put 12 fresh-baked loaves. They were not like loaves like you would buy at Walmart. It was this flat bread. They would put on there 12 unleavened loaves of bread. Every, every day they would put that on there. And that was according to the law. They did that according to the law until the, God sent the bread down from heaven in whom the law was going to be fulfilled. So God says, then let their, uh, where was I at on this? Yeah, let their table, verse, verse 9, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. I'm going to give them back for what they did. Because even though they were still, quote unquote, being obligated to lay the 12 loaves of fresh baked bread on the table of shoe bread every day. Their heart, they didn't believe what God said. They were doing it by religion. They were doing it by ritual. But they were not doing it by faith, looking unto the one who was going to fulfill what that meant. So they didn't believe it. When God sent his son, Jesus, the bread from heaven, they rejected that bread. And by this time, by the time God sent Jesus, the Jews had a temple. But what were they missing? The ark and the table and um, the menorah. Turn to... Jeremiah, let's see here, where is that list? Yeah, Jeremiah chapter 52, let me show you something. Jeremiah 52 is when Nebuchadnezzar raided Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been attacked before. No one had ever, no one had ever successfully raided it. The whole time that the, um, the Ark of the Covenant was in the temple, the, the candlestick and the table of showbread, that whole time that those three things were in that temple, no one ever, ever successfully raided Jerusalem. It never happened. But something happened after the days of Josiah. Because after Jos Josiah, we have a mentioning of the Ark of the Covenant. But after the days of Josiah, it's gone. The Ark is gone, the table of, is gone, and the candlestick is gone. The things that represent the Godhead, the Father being the covenant, Ark of the Covenant, the, um, the Son being the table of showbread, and the seven spirits of God are represented by the menorah. So now, in um, Jeremiah 52, verse 17, he mentions the pillars of brass. Then in... Um, Carried all the brass of them to Babylon. Verse 17. Verse 18. He mentions the cauldrons, the shovels, the snuffers, the bowls, the spoons, the vessels of brass, the basins. Verse 19. Fire pans, bowls, cauldrons, candlesticks, spoons, cups, the gold, the silver, 
The two pillars of brass um, gives their length 18 cubits. Uh, the chapter, five cubits in verse 22. Verse 23 mentions there was 96 pomegranates on it. It mentions all of these things that they took out of the temple when Nebuchadnezzar raided Jerusalem, stole it out of there, took it back to Babylon. And what's missing out of the... I mean, they even mentioned the spoons and the snuffers, but they didn't get the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, and the, and the candlestick. Didn't get those three things. Now, those are the most important... Those, in fact, if you were going to put a worth on it, those are the three most expensive things that they had. Because they were made... They were acacia tree, but they were overlaid with pure gold. Okay? What happened to them? We don't know. There is nothing in the Bible that tells us that. And then... When they come back from Babylonian captivity, they're going to build the temple again. Um, Cyrus, king of Persia, orders the release of all the stuff that was taken from the temple to be brought back to the temple. And it was all brought back. No ark, no table of showbread, no menorah. So that by the time the real bread from heaven shows up, Jesus... The Jews are practicing a very empty religion. They cannot even come close to fulfilling the law because there's no table, there's no candlestick, and there's no Ark of the Covenant. It's gone. God made it impossible for them to fulfill the requirements of the Old Covenant. He did that for a reason, I believe. Now, is it going to be, one of these days, going to be revealed where it is? I don't know, and God says, don't worry about it. But anyway, back in Romans chapter 11, he says, um, verse 10, let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back all way. Now, verse 11. So Paul's going to said, now I want you to think about this. I say then, that's the, Paul the lawyer talking. I'm going to give you a summation here. He said, think about that term. for what I just said. Think about it. And he says, I say then, have they stumbled? that they should fall. God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. We have a story of two brothers in the Bible and one of them was jealous of the other. Who am I talking about? Huh? Take your pick. Yeah, take your pick. Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau. Okay, because both of those are examples. Isaac and Ishmael. Same story. Again, take your pick. All three of those. Cain and Abel, Isaac, Ishmael, Jacob and Esau. But think about Jacob and Esau. Okay, and the jealousy that God used to provoke Esau. Esau had already given up the promise of his birthright because he came in hungry, wanted Jacob to give him a bowl of food. Jacob said, tell you what, sell me your birthright and I'll give it to you. And Esau is like this beast of a man going, what good's a birthright if I'm starving to death? Okay, I'm sure it wasn't that serious, but that's how he thought. And he says, fine, take it. And he sold his birthright, which he would have had forever. And from that moment on, then, of course, you remember the story when Jacob, uh, or excuse me, Isaac tells Esau, go out, kill me some venison, bring it in, cook it up, make me some savory meat, bring it to me and I'll bless you. Well, then Rebecca said, hey, Jacob, while Esau's gone, Take this meat in. That's when he covered his arms with goat fur. That was one hairy guy. And he goes in. You know the story. And Esau is provoked to jealousy. And I've always told people, go back and compare the blessings. Esau did get a blessing. And it was almost word for word identical to what Jacob got. Okay? 
But Esau was told, until your brother's dominion is taken off you, you'll never get it. So I think Esau represents Israel, the Jews, which now are, and they cannot have their blessing until we are taken into heaven. Then they can have their blessing. Okay? Um, so he said, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So something's going to happen. And they're going to be restored back to a fullness, but it's going to be a greater fullness than what they had the first time. Think of the best meal you've ever had in your life and you stuffed yourself. Now, could anything top that? God's going to give you one. He's going to give you a meal that's so good, you will stuff yourself twice in a row with it. And that's what's going to happen. He says, for I speak to you, verse 13, I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify in mine office, if by any means I may provoke to immolation them which are in my flesh, or am, which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Think of the Shunammite woman. Think of Lazarus. Think of Christ. Think of, um, Oh, who am I trying to think of? Well, let me move on. But life from the dead. For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Now, then he's going to get into this, starting in verse 17. The tree is Christ. The Hebrew roots movement will tell you that the tree is the Hebraic religion or the Hebraic view of how they see things or the law. No, it's not. The tree is Christ. We are the branches grafted in contrary to our nature. The law wasn't given to our forefathers. We were not raised up as little Jewish boys and girls. It is contrary to our nature. So think about that. The natural branches are Israel, but they were broken off because John the vine dresser will tell you you've got a vine coming out and it doesn't produce any grapes. What do you do to it, John? Chop. Chop. You don't cut the vine down, do you? No, the vine's still good. Vine's producing grapes. That particular branch is not. You cut it off. Okay, and if you want to hybridize some grapes, you get some grapes from a different tree, a vine, and you graft it. Did you ever do any grafting? You didn't? You ever see it done? Okay, you graft that in there and somehow, some way, that other vine from that branch from that other vine can be grafted in, tied into that. It starts receiving of the nourishment of that and now you have a, it just like crosses the genetics somehow. And this is a natural way of doing it. So in verse 17, if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. It is not us who is keeping Christianity alive and well in this earth. And that has been the mistake of one church and one denomination after the other. Or one Christian after another. To think that Christianity rests on us to protect. There is a uh, preacher that I never really did care much for. His name was Jack Hiles. And he built a big independent King James church up from nothing up to had probably 12, 15,000 people in it. 
And back during the 60s and 70s, he had the name amongst all the fundamentalist King James churches. He was Mr. Church, Mr. Fundamentalist. Well, he got caught in a scandal, big one, bad one. Okay? And I think the stories I heard were true. His daughter's going around telling her stories now that, yeah, Dad did this. But he denied it. And it was one of the, part of the scandal was being brought up by one of his own deacons. He only had like 27 deacons in this church. And one of them brought an accusation that this Jack Howells with this, with, he's with my wife all the time. And of course, Hiles railed on this poor deacon. And the statement that he made was, you can't bring me down. If you bring me down, you'll bring down fundamentalism. And the guy wrote an article in a Christian magazine, and he said, if our religion is based upon Jack Hiles, it should be torn down. Not that even if he's done nothing wrong, if what we believe and what we stand for is founded upon that man, then it's doomed to fail. And some, but what happens is some people get the idea that Christianity hinges on them and what they do. And it was never about that. That's what Israel was taken off for, was that they thought that they were the people who were going to protect God, and God doesn't need man's protection. So what happened? So verse 19, or verse 18, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. In other words, God loves us Gentiles more than he loves the Jews. Don't think that either. Do not replace them. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness, if, underline the word if, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt also be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, and most of them will, most Jews, even the ones who are alive at that time, are still going to reject Jesus. And God's going to reject them. Okay? There are international Jewish New World Order conspiracies. There are. And God's going to punish them for it. But then he said, um, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be uh, grafted in. For, where was I at? Yeah, 23. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be graft into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, let me stop right here. What God said he did to Israel, in that he took their branch off of the tree. Same thing Jesus said to the Laodicean church in Revelation 3. The, candle, the menorah, the candlestick, looked like and it had a, a, a knop, a flower, and a bud. And it basically was like a, an olive tree or an almond tree or whatever. And it had those decorations on it, like a tree. And Jesus told the Laodicean church, if, if you don't, guys don't straighten up, then I will come and I will remove your candlestick out of the midst of those seven. I will take you out. The same thing that God swore in the New Testament is exactly what God did in the Old Testament. He took Israel's branch off the tree. 
Why? Because they refused to acknowledge Christ by faith. It was either by boasting, it was by pride, or it was by works. And you can have the works. We can come here, we can come to church Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. We, you can watch the things that I do every week. We can practice this religion until Jesus comes back and found I, find out that we were lost the whole time and be taken out. Okay? What God did with Israel in the Old Testament, he promises to the Laodicean church, if you don't straighten up, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to do the exact same thing. Is God able to graft Israel back in? Oh yeah, absolutely. They're the natural branches. That's whose tree they came from. Because Christ was the lawgiver.